Hello YouTube and Patreon, this is Nathan P. Butler and this is our project update for the month of July 2020. Um, it is another hot day here. I've been outside working on stuff and I will be going back outside as soon as this is done being recorded, which is why I'm a little bit out of breath. Um, it's just hot as hell right now. Um, and this room is the hottest room in the house, especially when the light is on. So uh, let's see if we can get through this fairly quickly, but there are a couple of uh, important things, I guess, to note for those who are really trying to keep up with what's going on around here. First off, let me thank all of you who are backers over there on my Patreon. That is patreon.com slash Nathan P. Butler, all as one word. Um, we start out with that first tier, that $1 tier, which are the travelers through the Butler universe, the folks who get mentions here, get mentions in the credits for this, and we'll get uh, that little credit there, the thanks, in the second edition of A Saga on Home Video. So, uh, in no particular order, because it's just however they are on my screen, we have Preston Ellis, Jeremy Goss, Ben Abrams, Michael Torson, Jacob Kapoor, Daniel Marchant, Tony Jenkins, Kevin Kreiner, Austin Pierce, and Chris Walker. Then we have the denizens of the Butler universe. Those are the folks who have that $5 tier, who also, along with what the $1 tier gets, get access to those audio commentaries that I put up to every single month. Uh, right now, primarily for the Clone Wars. We have uh, Jeff Rabjohns, if I'm saying that correctly, Dave Broadway, Matt DeRochers, Joseph Blankenship, Travis Taylor, Andrew Gilbertson, Walker Langstrat, Kyle Pellegree, Jeff Ellis, Joey Zitzman, Stephen Malicia. I keep thinking that I'm going to say that wrong. I think I just said it right again, but it just it goes in one ear and right out the other, I think, right now because uh, it's so freaking hot. Uh, Robert Medina, Bobby Craig, Jeremiah Mustard, and Jason Hunt. Then finally, we have the nobility of the Butler universe, those who get what the other two tiers get, but also get access to that exclusive Q&A video every single month, where they're the only ones who get to ask the questions and the only ones who get access to the videos with the answers to their questions. We have Connor Steyerman. I think I said it right this time. We have Jonathan Pickens. We have Matthew Hardesty, Aaron Melzak, Jonathan Comfer, Ennis, Sam Howard, Benjamin Handel, and Brian Snook, and Andrew Bettis. So the last of our project updates was posted on June 27th. So what is up on Patreon now since that time? We had a commentary number 68 for The Clone Wars, which was Water War, kicking off Season 4. Then we had uh, the Nobility of the Butler Universe exclusive Q&A number 31, posted on July 8th. And then the commentary on July 15th was the one for, of course, the next one after Water War, which is Gungan Attack, which is commentary number 69 for The Clone Wars. That is episode 68 chronologically, not counting the film. The film does get a number in the number of episodes, so it is episode 69 of those commentaries. Remember, though, there are also commentaries up for volume 1 and 2 of Forces of Destiny as well, so we're past the 70 mark on the commentaries. As far as production of the commentaries goes, for what it's worth, um, I'm actually done recording and editing commentaries through the last commentary for November, which is November 15th, um, all the way through the end of the Umbara arc in Season 4 chronologically. So I'm making it a point to try to get ahead. Um, basically, I had an opportunity, we'll talk about in a minute, to record at night while my son was asleep. He's on the other side of this far wall as I'm sitting in here, and I sit on the other side of my desk where the camera is when I record. So I wasn't sure if I would be waking him up if I were to try to record while he was asleep, and apparently it doesn't wake him up, which is allowing me to have more time to actually get those commentaries recorded ahead of time. And the more I can get those done in advance, the more I can finally switch and do some of the things I want to do, like actually finally finishing out Forces of Destiny with Volumes 3 and 4 and stuff like that. So uh, that, so far, is working very well. Now, obviously, the last of these project updates, I talked a bit about my retirement from regular podcasting. I've been doing it since 2002. It was time to finally retire. And uh, the, my last episode of Star Wars Beyond the Films, which is probably my last podcast, at this point, I haven't talked to Michael Morris about Cloud City Casino in a while because he's so busy, I'm so busy, I'm just hard to get together. So if I show up on another episode of Cloud City Casino, my guess would be it would probably be for like a pre-recorded little opening message or something to go in like an opening skit, and that's basically it, rather than being in the main episode, probably. I haven't had a chance to finish playing back through Jedi Fallen Order, so not sure how much I'd be able to converse about that intelligently. So, um, Cloud City Casino, don't know what the status is at the moment, but my guess is I won't be on another full episode, at least. Um, but then for Star Wars Beyond the Films, we had episode number 248, which is my final episode, entitled, as Mark entitled it, Feedback and Farewell. Um, so if you're interested in a feedback episode, or my final episode and sort of some final thoughts before we wrap things up there, um, some final messages and stuff that came in, 
then uh, check that out. It's over at StarWarsReport.com, as is Cloud City Casino. Uh, you can check out you know, back episodes of either of those and of Star Wars Report's Rebels Roundtable whenever we were covering Rebels up through Season 2 back in the day. All over there on that same website. The vocal material at this point is coming out through YouTube, of course. And um, I basically recorded a bunch of stuff, basically on one day. I just sort of sat down on one Sunday when I actually had the opportunity, and I have it on most Sundays lately. I sat down and just belted out a ton of short episodes from the Star Wars Home Video Library that I've gone through now and edited, uh, I think in their entirety. I think they're all edited now and up on the YouTube channel. So stuff that I sort of took notes on when I couldn't record so that I'd have the notes in front of me and just rapid fire through them. Like those episodes where you, s you see over off to the corner here on top of these tubs, just a pile of stuff that actually goes all the way back to that wall as I'm grabbing and doing, grabbing and doing, grabbing and doing. Um, so we had episodes uh, 304 through 319 and intermission number 11. So we had uh, in episode 304, it was the Zabby Rise of Skywalker Collector's Editions that finally arrived. In episode 305, we had the Buy and Keep Sky Store Rise of Skywalker versions from the UK. Uh, episode 306, we looked at a Trivial Pursuit uh, Star Wars Saga Edition, that sort of game with DVD thing that we've looked at before, except this time with a Pacquiao action figure. In episode 307, we compared the DVD, Blu-ray, and 4K releases of A New Hope, just as a case example, to basically compare the US to Australia in terms of sort of how other regions dealt with the fact that they didn't have releases back in September 2019, which allows all of them to put out all their black packaging with the 2019 McClunky editions, whereas in the U.S., which edition you get depends on which of the current products you buy, which is asinine. We had episode number 308. We were looked at the VHD of the double feature making of Star Wars and SPFX The Empire Strikes Back. That was the last Japanese VHD I still needed. In episode 309, we looked at a screener for the Clone Wars micro series, an Emmy screener. In episode 310, we looked at a promotional screener from before the season started for season four of The Clone Wars. That's The Clone Wars. Episode 311, we looked at SPFX The Empire Strikes Back from the UK on VHS. Episode 312, we looked at the same thing, except this time from Australia on VHS. Episode 313, we looked at the making of specials, that is, making of Star Wars, Classic Creatures Return of the Jedi, and from Star Wars to Jedi, the making of a saga, but not SPFX The Empire Strikes Back, uh, from the UK from circa 1990. In episode 314, we looked at a 1991 Japanese dubbed copy of uh, A New Hope on VHS from their best library, as they called it. Episode 315, we looked at uh, A New Hope from 1995, right, so the THX Remastered Edition, but it was the... Um, the version that basically has a narration for those who have low vision or blindness, the descriptive video service or DVS version. Episode 316, we looked at what appeared to be an internal VHS from Skywalker Sound with two different versions, two different aspect ratio versions of Teaser A and Trailer B for The Phantom Menace. In episode 317, we looked at quite a few items that had to do with AFI's 100 Years 100 Movies collection, which is a tie-in, because it includes Star Wars, to that Century Collection giant a box set we looked at a while back, or four boxes box set, that 100 plus pound giant 100 VHS film collection. In episode 318, we looked at even more releases of Spaceballs, these all coming from Matt Fry uh, into my collection, which is awesome. And then uh, episode 319, we looked at Making of Star Wars, again, this time the 1979 American beta version. Then we had intermission number 11, and that was taking a look at a fan made basically Revenge of the Sith VHS as if it had been released in the United States, which of course it wasn't. But I wanted to make sure that everybody kind of knew what it was because it's making the rounds on eBay and places like that so you know what it is and what it is not in case you're looking for a fan recreation to fill that hole in a uh, collection. But at the same time, you know, make sure you know that it's not a legitimate thing. Though that's probably obvious because I've said many, many times there was no Revenge of the Sith VHS release in the U.S. Just elsewhere. Whew, God, it is hot. Um, let's see, beyond that, uh, nothing else is recorded yet video-wise, and because it is so freaking hot, there's absolutely no way I'm going to have an opportunity to record anything else after I get this recorded. I'm going to have to go back outside and get that crap done that I was in the middle of, and it's just too hot in here to do it. I'm going to have to wait until sometime at night, or just a cooler day, or something. Um, my asthma's hitting me. I'm about to pass out in here, I feel like. Um, let's see. Uh, oh! I'm looking over here at a couple of uh, of the project boards that I removed from over here so you could see. Uh, in case I haven't mentioned it, I did do some rearranging. We now have one, two, three, four shelves of home video stuff. 
And then the bottom two shelves are the books. Um, I took a bunch of my uh, advanced early uncorrected proof copies of books and stuff like that and stuck them out in the garage in some tubs and then left in here mostly just my signed Star Wars books. And so they're taking up the bottom couple of shelves. And then this shelf here, all home video all the way through. Next one, all home video all the way through, except for a one that's got a bunch of books that I still need to make my way through reading. Um, and I've, you know, been loading up the project boards. Now we have five project boards back here to protect everything because even sitting on their side with the three different sections and covering basically up to about here, uh, my son was able to reach between them and get at stuff. So now we have one, two, three, and then two in between so that he can't just reach in and grab stuff. Um, but I did rearrange all this stuff recently. So in case I haven't shown you recently, I know I showed the nobility of the butt learnerverse, I think in the last Q and A, but I don't think I had a chance to show you guys that in the, just the regular project update. Um, let's see, um, a saga on home video second edition is proceeding along very well. I'm almost done with another full reread and edit going in and adding stuff and tweaking stuff as I go. Uh, my next step is probably going to be to make a giant list of all the pictures I still need to take so I can try to rapid fire those sometime soon, make a note of the different topics I still need to cover. Um, and it's looking great, but it's, you know, it's, it's coming together well, but I have no idea if that's going to be something for late 2020 or early 2021 at this point. It's just really hard to gauge because it all comes down to when I have time to write, when I have time to edit, when I have time to take the pictures. And the pictures are the biggest downside right now because basically you know, on Sunday afternoon, I have stuff around the house to do, recording any videos, recording any podcasts, but thankfully that's all done now, um, taking any pictures for the book. One time and getting packages ready right now. Um, the process right now of sending out the packages where uh, Matt Fry had sent me a huge collection to sort of sort through, to put some stuff into mine, and then if there was stuff that I didn't need, I was then uh, kind of paying it forward by sending it out to members of the community over on the Facebook uh, Star Wars Home Video group. I have two giant boxes left to pack. I'll probably hopefully get those packed tonight um, to go out, and then a couple I have to check for pricing on shipments because it's supposed to go to the UK, and then that will all be done. Um, but many of my Sundays recently have been spent packing up boxes, getting shipping quotes, and stuff like that. Um, so more productive in terms of YouTube than it really kind of feels like this month. It really kind of feels like I've had maybe one day total in this entire month to really be particularly productive. Um, partly because I did not take a break. I am working through summer session two, which is the second summer school session after working the first summer school session. And that's heading immediately into pre-planning in the new school year. Um, so I, like, it's like I said before, I had a break in spring break back in April, and I'm going to have a break for Thanksgiving. No breaks in between at all. Uh, but that is my choice because we could use the cash for stuff like this, right? For stuff like the collection and whatnot. There is one other thing I wanted to update you on since a lot of folks who view these videos are viewers of from the Star Wars Home Video Library. I think we're screwed, or I've been screwed, by DHL. Um, I mentioned when we did the episode about the 1991 Japanese VHS that I had some really cool stuff coming from Japan. Some rare stuff coming from Japan. What that was is that Jeremy Goss had spotted on eBay a seller who was selling the entire original trilogy on Video 8. The 8mm video format that did not have any Star Wars, uh, well, retail Star Wars releases in the United States at all. Um, because they just weren't doing it through that particular company, um, but that had Video 8 releases in the UK that I've been trying to track down for years with no luck, um, and that had releases in Japan, and wound up finding all three of them at once. I worked with that Japanese seller so that we could get those, and my thought process was, wrongly so apparently, that since recent stuff coming from Japan and from the UK that came through Amazon, came DHL and was fine. And in fact, a package I got late last week came through DHL and was fine, that DHL is fine. And DHL was very, very fast compared to the weeks it would have taken to get something from the UK or weeks it would have taken to get something from Japan. And I wanted to be able to get those in my hands and start using them for the book and get them on the show quickly. So I asked the seller to get a shipping quote from DHL and to please ship at DHL if it was feasible thinking it would be faster. Well, it got into the U.S. lightning fast. 
And then DHL bent us over and screwed us. Um, basically, on not this past Friday, but the previous Friday. So I've been dealing with this shit for a week now. Uh, over a week now. Um, the driver never even bothered to come anywhere near our home. And at 5.30 that afternoon, scanned it. I was here all day to get it. And we have a camera that looks at our driveway, that looks at the street, that looks at our mailbox, that looks at our front yard, that looks at our porch. Driver never showed up, but scanned at 5.30. Well, I attempted to deliver it, but nobody was home. Bullshit. Then the driver at 7 o'clock scanned it as, well, it's delivered. Bullshit. And then as soon as he was done, he took it back to the DHL station up in College Park, Georgia. Since nothing had arrived, but had been marked as delivered, I was pretty pissed. But this is kind of par for the course I'm finding with UPS, DHL, FedEx, any of these services where it's it must be there by a certain time and then they just don't get to it. They'll mark it as delivered or something or mark it as attempted when it wasn't true so they can just deliver it again some other time. So to make sure it would be delivered at another time, I call the DHL helpline, which of course is a national line because you can't go online and find a phone number for the local station, even if I knew that was a station. All I knew at the time was that it just wasn't delivered, not uh, any question about whether or not it got returned to the station. And the very helpful lady that Friday night told me, you know what? Those scans were errors. Bullshit. The scans were errors. He's covering his own butt, but errors. Um, and that, don't worry, it got checked back into the DHL station. You should be able to continue seeing it move when it eventually is sent to you by checking the tracking number. And yet the tracking number didn't move, and the tracking number didn't even show that it got returned to the DHL station. Basically, the tracking number on the consumer side stops at delivered. So they're not open for their helpline on a weekend. That Monday, this past Monday, a week ago tomorrow as I'm recording this, I reach out to them again. And the help for person says, oh, well, that's odd. We do have it confirmed that it did come back to the station, but it hasn't moved since. Let's start an investigation so they can look into what's going on with this and they can either get it to you, get you to pick it up, uh, get it scheduled for redelivery or something. You'll hear something by 3.30 or 4 o'clock today, which apparently they weren't supposed to say because that's their old way of doing it. Before COVID, it was actually supposed to be within 24 hours. So by 3.30 or 4.00, I don't hear a thing. The next day I call, they say, no, it actually should be about 24 hours, but they can't tell me anything now because now that an investigation has started, all they can tell me is, well, it scans as delivered. They can't even acknowledge that they already told me twice and have it on their screen that it went back to the station. So they said, well, you'll get a call about the investigation. You'll get a call, you'll get a call, you'll get a call. That was Monday. Then Tuesday when they reminded me and said, no, it's actually supposed to be 24 hours. You'll get a call today. No call on Tuesday. Wednesday or Thursday. On Friday morning, I finally get a phone call from a guy who says, um, so I'm with the investigative team and we know that it went back to the station, but we can't get anybody at the station to answer our inquiries about what's going on with it right now. We can't get a response from our own effing station. And since time is up, this is all the time we're allotted for any investigation. There's shit all we can do for you now. Sorry, too bad, so sad. So I asked, well, maybe I can check with the station directly. What's the phone number? There isn't one, they claim. Bullshit. Um, well, okay. Then what's the address? I know that there's several DHL places when I search DHL near me on Google. Which one is it? It's the one in College Park. It's up there by the airport in, in the Atlanta area here. So on Friday, my wife gets home. We'll talk about that in just a moment. My wife gets home and... We drive up to the DHL station, and there's one person working the front. That's a very small little area. It's mostly for, like, the actual shipment of stuff, so I'm not surprised that the office is very small. Uh, two people allowed inside at a time, uh, so waiting around outside for a little bit in the heat um, as my wife and son are sitting in the car, and he is flipping out over the sound of airplanes, not in a good way, uh, and they're burning up outside. Um, I finally get let in, give the lady the information. She goes back to go look for the package or to have someone look for the package. 20 minutes later, she finally comes back up after leaving the desk completely unattended um, during that time to try to help me while me and another person are sitting there in the waiting room, just kind of waiting for the next step of the process, comes back, hasn't been able to find it yet, and the people she needs to have actually do the looking for it um, seem to be distracted by other things. So I ask if I can just go back out to the car for a second and turn the air conditioner on or something for my wife and son, um, 
and still be allowed back in because there's a huge line forming outside. If I step out, somebody's going to step in and that's two people, right? So what happens then? So she said, you know what? Give me your numbers. So I give her my regular number and an alternate number. And I get the phone number for the station that surprise, surprise, surprise actually effing exists when they said that it didn't. I take that and say, we will call you as soon as we know something. Within an hour, I get a phone call, not to tell me they know anything, but to ask me for the waybill number again, because the person who was supposed to look for it misplaced the paper with the number on it. Okay, I hear nothing. I try calling right before they close for the day. Um, here, let's transfer you to the person who can answer your question. Of course, that goes straight to voicemail. And that is where things stand right now. I'm, I've got maybe 4%, less than 5%. 4% hope that maybe they're going to find the package and maybe they're going to get it to me and maybe I will hear anything else. But at this point, I think I'm just screwed. I think I'm screwed out of the cash. I, I don't think the person in Japan is going to be able to do an insurance claim because trying to explain the situation to them is going to be very difficult because English was a bit of a barrier to begin with. And I don't feel like I should ask for a refund from the seller because I was the one who chose DHL like a moron thinking they were going to be okay to deliver this. So I think I'm out the cash and I'm out these incredibly rare items that I don't know if I will ever be able to replace. Which also means not being able to cover them in the book. So in the book, probably what I'm going to wind up covering when I talk about video 8, if I don't manage to get my hands on one from the UK or another one from Japan or DHL finds my shit, I'm going to wind up basically having to show it with an Indiana Jones copy just to say this is what they looked like in the U.S. and in Japan and the U.K. They had stuff like this for Star Wars. And I'll be able to show a little um, Video 8 cassette that's actually up there on the shelf um, of a Pizza Hut training video from the Episode 1 promotion, which is really the only way there were Video 8 stuff um, produced for Star Wars in the United States. But as you can tell, anytime I think about this and talk about this, I'm a bit livid or I'm just really bummed out having been now out the money and out these incredibly rare items that I was really excited when Jeremy pointed me to. And it's not on Jeremy, it's not on the, the seller. It's on me for choosing effing DHL. And then it's on DHL for being a shit show. Suffice to say, um, I don't know what to do at this point with it. However, except when I'm actually taking the time to detail it, I found that I'm able to kind of be more calm about it and just be like, this too shall pass. This kind of crap happens. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no sense dwelling on it. If it shows up, it shows up. Keep calling, you know, to check in, but probably won't happen. And that is because something happened this week that put things in perspective. Um, and I've said before that when it came to how seriously I used to take Star Wars stuff when it came to like the timeline and message boards and things like that and how hostile sometimes I would get uh, about certain things that... What sort of gave me perspective was my wife fighting cancer before we were married. I mean, we were just dating. That it becomes, you know, you realize that there are things that are way more important than hobbies. And if a hobby is stressing you out, you're doing it wrong. Which I guess is advice I'm taking right now or trying to take right now with relation to the Video 8 stuff. Um, but last week, we thought my wife had COVID-19. Um, she works at a hospital and comes into contact with a lot of people. Um, they are allowed to wear masks, they are allowed to wear gloves, but that is it. Um, they are now actually probably going to mandate face shields, which is good because um, she works in like a little food service type area. So most of the time she's just dealing with people who come down to pick up stuff, unless they're needing help like preparing things to take up the floors to like the COVID floors, plural, that are COVID only right now at her hospital. Um, but she is never the one who actually has to go up and deliver it. In fact, if they ask, she flat out tells them no, because that's not her job description, that is too dangerous because she is high risk. Um, numerous people in her department have come down with COVID-19. Between her department and the department right across the hall from hers, multiple people she knows has died from, or have, excuse me, have died from COVID-19. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole, is it a hoax or not thing? Um, though, if you do believe it is a hoax, feel free to post on the comments that you believe it's a host. That way I will know to block you totally fine. Um, but suffice to say, she started feeling ill. And the protocol is, if you're feeling ill, you need to contact the whoever it is um, within the hospital, and they will fast track a test for you. So that was Tuesday night. 
They told her to self-isolate, so she winds up staying in a hotel. On that Wednesday morning, she gets a test. One of those shove it all the way up your nose till it's like way up here kind of tests. Um, still is feeling like crap, her temperature rising and rising and rising. If it breaks 101, she has to go to the ER, or the ED as they call it there. Um, she eventually gets the test result back the next day. Like I said, fast-tracked because of hospital employees. And even though she's not really front, well, she, not front line in terms of dealing with patients, just dealing with like the other personnel there. Um, thank God it comes back negative. Um, we don't know what it was. Flu, bad cold, sinus infection, probably the way that she's been feeling. Um, but she waits until finally she has passed the, the 24 hours without a fever and then is able to come back home. And she's actually getting home on the morning we have to go out to deal with DHL bullshit. But it puts things in perspective because if that had been COVID and we had no way of knowing and with the odds at her place of work plus her comorbidities, as they're called, um, the likelihood was pretty high. And the likelihood is pretty high that if she ever gets COVID-19, she probably will not survive it. And that puts things in perspective because you realize that because of the way that this virus is working and the way the quarantine is working of patients because of how communicable it is, the last time you saw somebody could be the last time you see somebody in person. Um, because if somebody winds up finding themselves ill, goes to the hospital, you're not going to see them in person after that point. And if they die, the last time you saw them in person is the last time, the last interaction, the last conversation before they got ill, the last time she would have interacted with our son. Um, and then the questions of things like, if this is COVID and she does pass, how do I explain that to our son? What do we do now? It's a lot of big picture questions that you don't really want to face as you know, a husband, as a father, you don't want to look at those questions because those are uncomfortable topics to even consider. But there are times when they slap you in the face and you have to consider them. You have to look at them. And it's absolutely terrifying. It's about the scariest, most numbing, shocking, stop you in your tracks type of thing that I've run into in my adult life, if not my whole life. Um, Cancer was, it's all right, you can beat this. You can do, we can do this, right? You definitely have cancer, but you can do this. There's treatment. With COVID, it's, what do we do? Which is not a, a, a good place to be. So some of my productivity actually of trying to record at night when he was asleep for those commentaries was because I was trying to keep my mind off of it as much as I could when trying to calm down to go to sleep. Um... And some of the editing that I did was trying to get stuff edited that was already recorded to calm down so that I could just kind of get through the day. Um, thank God she turned out that she was fine this time. Um, but it's, it's just, it's not something I would wish on anybody. That kind of fear, that kind of worry, that kind of anguish, that kind of not knowing if the last time you saw someone will be the last time you see someone uh, in person. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Even some of the leaders around the country who aren't bothering to take it seriously enough. I wouldn't wish it on them either. Um, because it's not something that any person, if you care about just people in general, um, should have to deal with. And yet, it's a part of life in this age of COVID-19. So, suffice to say, uh, it was a more productive month than it turned out I thought it was going to be. All because of that one day of doing the recordings and those few nights of trying to get my, my mind off stuff. Um, still dealing with DHL right now, but with all of that, it's not a big surprise probably that I can't really be as worried about the DHL stuff right now as I normally would be because, yeah, they're rare items, but they're just Star Wars home video items. It's just money. It's just money. It's just the collection. It's just the book. It's just stuff. Um, it's not the kind of life or death life-altering type of stuff that so many out there are dealing with right now in situations where, you know, God forbid, a test doesn't come back negative. So, um, in any event, just want to kind of make sure that you're aware of that. So for those of you who are fans of From the Star Wars Home Video Library, we may not have that promised awesome Japanese stuff to show in the near future. I'm still working on it, but 
there's only so much I can do at this point, and if I've got to just write it off and say, screw it and move on, then that's what I'm going to have to do. So, um, that about does it for this update. I know it's a little bit longer than normal, uh, and has a little bit more depth, I guess, uh, in what's going on than normal, but um, thank you all for your patronage. If you're over on Patreon, thank you all for watching over there on YouTube uh, and listening to the podcasts over the years. As new stuff comes up, uh, new stuff rolls out, then obviously I will address that in our next monthly update. Again, thank you all very much, and uh, stay safe out there.